Our session today will explore critical support that is part of the social infrastructure that Eric Klinenberg introduced to us in the keynote just prior to this session, and that is community foundations. Community foundations are on the ground at the front lines of crises, and certainly in the past 18 plus months, from COVID-19, a racial reckoning, a series of natural disasters, we have certainly experienced quite a few. In direct and close contact with and within their communities, community foundations are uniquely positioned to mobilize resources quickly and know who and what organizations can be activated in real time and with efficiency. In philanthropy and COVID-19 in 2020, measuring one year of giving, a report authored by Candid in close partnership with the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, we found that community foundations awarded more grants than any other grant maker type in response to this crisis. They have played a critical role in organizing funds, partnering with local organizations, and providing much needed support. We are fortunate to have with us today two community foundation leaders who will share their experiences and lessons learned over the past 18 plus months as they responded to this moment's challenges and crises. We have with us today Katrina DeBerry, Program Officer for Thriving Communities at the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, and Marianne Cannon, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Stanislaus Community Foundation. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for your time and for being with us. Katrina, I'd like to start with you. Could you please introduce yourself by sharing a bit about your organizations, your organization, the communities you serve, and since we are still convening in a virtual world, help us be armchair travelers and tell us what makes your community unique and what you hope we can experience should we visit when we can freely travel again. Sure. Well, thank you, Michelle, um, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, again, my name is Katrina DeBerry, and I am a program officer with the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. Um, I have been a program officer for a little over four years now, um, and it is actually my first foray into the world of philanthropy. Um, prior to that, I worked with the Atlanta Regional Commission for 13 years, um, and so I had the honor and privilege of being able to be a part of our 23 county region in some capacity. And so if I were to say, come visit Atlanta, um, the first thing I would say is you can get any experience you want, any lifestyle experience you want in within the city of Atlanta, within Metro Atlanta region and within Georgia on the whole. And I say that um, because in the last week I have, hiked with my children in Roswell um, and seen waterfalls. I have had uh, lunch in a cute little uh, community Avondale Estates and got a Ray Buzz <laughs> um, and sat curbside with, with a friend. Um, I have gone to uh, see emerging artists perform in a local gallery at night under the stars. Um, and I've had coffee in my back deck and watched the deer walk by um, as, I, as, I, as I drunk it before the kids woke up. Um, and so you can, you can have pretty much any experience. I, I would say if you wanted to see the beach, you'd have to travel a little bit um, to, to South Georgia, but it's still, it's still an option. Great. But thank you for having me. Thank you for that. Marianne, can I ask the same? Sure, I wanna hang out with Katrina in Atlanta. <laughs> we actually had very similar weekends. Um, so um, my name is Marianne Cannon. Um, really grateful to be here with all of you, albeit virtually. Um, so Stanislaus Community Foundation, we are in the heart of the Central Valley in Northern California. So I think most people have an image in their minds uh, when they think about California, and that's not Stanislaus. Um, we're a very agricultural community. We're the world's leading producer of almonds and walnuts and um, apricots. Um, so our primary industry is still agriculture, but we are an hour and a half uh, east of Silicon Valley. So a lot of commuter pressure uh, that's impacting our community that I'm going to unpack at some point, hopefully during this call. And then uh, we're an hour south of, of uh, the state capital, uh, Sacramento, and we're on the way to Yosemite. So like Katrina, we're within driving distance of a lot of incredible assets and amenities um, in California. And yet uh, we are also, because of our agrarian roots, there's fruit stands and farm stands on almost every corner. We're surrounded by almond trees. Um, there's farmers markets that are really vibrant, outdoor venues for music. 
we're actually, this community foundation is beginning to play a leadership role in revitalizing our river and uh, rehabilitating our river. So uh, a really wonderful community to raise children in, um, partly. <laughs> and uh, our population is about 540,000 people. And we're both uh, primarily uh, Latino, certainly uh, the white community, but Assyrian, which is my nationality, a huge Middle Eastern population here, um, a huge Af growing Afghan population here. So um, yeah, we're, and I, we always tell people that the coastal regions of California 20 years from now will look exactly the way they look now. There'll be some minor changes, but they'll be on the same trajectory. Um, it's a wide open field in the central part of California and in the inland region. And so we as a community foundation are really playing a strong role in sort of crafting that future with our community. So really excited about being able to make that type of impact in a smaller community in California. Thank you both for sharing about your, your hometowns and where you are and your communities. Um, appreciate that. Um, for our first question, I'd like to tie it back to Eric Klinenberg's talk and the importance of social infrastructure and the role that, tr that trust plays in building it. I'd like, like to ask both of you if you can share a bit about how your community has worked to build trust and solid relationships so that in time of crises, they know where to go for help. Marianne, can I ask you to share first? Absolutely. And, you know, trust is a long game and it's a game that has to happen in proximity. And I think that's why as place-based funders, community foundations really are critical to local trust building efforts because we are, unlike national funders or just issue related funders, we are shopping at the same markets as our grantees and as our elected officials, as our administrators, we're, our kids are in the same schools, we're grappling with the same issues. So it's to be in place and to be in proximity to the issues uh, is so critical. And so when a crisis happens, you know, um, we always say change, as Cubby would say, change happens at the speed of trust. And so we have for years, as most community foundations have, not just through funding, but through leadership efforts, really built that, that relational field um, to, to tackle things like educational attainment, homelessness, so when COVID struck, we were in a prime position because what we saw is all our public officials were on the front lines, you know, both on our school districts and also at our county and our public health systems. So they were literally in firefighting mode. And so we had the opportunity to be a little more reflective. We certainly had a little more space to be more responsive and not reactive. And so that, and we'll, I know, unpack sort of what that looked like, but Trust is critical, especially in communities like ours, I will tell you, Michelle, um, sort of our sort of suburban communities where the meds and eds, the traditional sort of stalwarts or anchor institutions have really evaporated in terms of local leadership. Our hospitals, the CEOs come from other bigger systems. They're elsewhere, they're now remote. So you don't see that sort of hospital CEO character, if you will. And then our educational institutions, it's the same thing. You have technical bureaucrats and kind of helicopter in for, in communities like ours, really at the tail end of their professional career. And so when you look for leadership in the community that's local, that's built on years of trust building, you don't necessarily see it in the same anchor institutions that you would see it in maybe in larger geographies. There's just less less institutional leadership that's local and kind of comes from within. So I think all of that is really put a pressure, and I will say a, in a good way, on the role of community foundations. And what I always say about community foundations is we occupy this really sacred intersectional place between obviously resource and wealth that's local and need, right? And challenges that's local. And so to be carrying the water back and forth um, and really treat that, that intersection in a sacred way and in a relational way, it really, we found that it served us when COVID struck because our donors called us immediately. What can we do? Where can we help? And our nonprofits called us and it was literally calls and we did a, a flash survey that we kept up every week we would, but it was real time, but you know, it was, we really, that's when our relationships came into play to be able to advise our donors and also support our nonprofits with more than funding, by the way, we really started doing briefings and, and webinars right away. Thank you so much for that. Katrina, would you like to share your experience? Sure. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, just to, to piggyback off of what Marion said, we, you know, we really are at this 
this kind of intersectional point between community and our donors. And I think one of the things that um, our foundation did was to be really honest about, you know, the, the, the history behind, you know, what it means to be a foundation. We are a 70 year old institution, you know, who, whose donors have built a lot of their wealth um, off the backs of the people that we support and that our nonprofit support. And so we, we began this journey just to unpack what it means to be um, an organization committed to equity. Um, and I would say what COVID did for us was push us to not tiptoe around the ideas of equity and to really um, challenge ourselves to, to speak directly to racial equity. And so in order to do that and to do that um, transparently, we had to have some tough conversations with donors we had to have tough conversations internally, and we had to reprioritize um, the voices of our community members, um, which, which was really critical to, to assist us with that trust building process, right? Because the reality is the community that we serve do not trust us, right? <laughs> right? They don't trust us in the way that we want them to. And so it's an ongoing process. Um, part of what we did with our COVID response, we, we also, you know, used our donors and utilized our, our relationships to, to, to act quickly in response to COVID. Um, but on the grant making end, we had to reevaluate what we asked our nonprofits for when it comes to, to grants, who we grant to. And so, you know, tactically we reduced the, the amount of, reporting standards or criteria we asked for when grant making during COVID um, because it was an emergency um, response. And then we started to look at those local grassroots on the ground, nonprofits and community led groups who are more directly linked to the community members most in need. And there were a lot of first time grants that we gave to smaller nonprofits. Um, and, and that went to just rebuilding relationships within community. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Let me ask, thanks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if we could go a little deeper on that, that section, you know, the idea of what are some of the things that were done that you feel are going to be, you know, helpful as you move forward? I mean, what, you know, what other changes has made? So you talked a little bit about reporting requirements and, um, you know, looking at first time grantees. Um, can you go a little bit into more detail on what that looked like? Um, I think specifically with our COVID response, um, you know, it was it was a process. We we first started to look at the existing relationships we had with larger organizations, um, and then and then look more deeply with with the relationship they had with grassroots organ organizations. Um, we also have the privilege to have had an, had a program on um, the neighborhood fund that we, that we've had for over 20 years, which was very intentional about going into, into communities, um, and doing grant making with organizations that were not necessarily 501c3. So, so we utilize those relationships, um, to, to make sure that we were reaching those critical, uh, residents, um, and then we, we, we targeted our approach to what immediate needs were, um, education, housing, um, eviction process, policy and advocacy. Um, our COVID response was really dependent on what was critical at that moment. Um, over the course of a year and a half, we, we had nine rounds of funding. Um, so we, we really tried to make sure that we met the emergent needs, and that we continue that process throughout recovery. Thank you for that. Marianne, can you share some of the changes that you've made in the past 18 plus months? Sure, we really being a smaller community foundation and um, recognize that the biggest funder in our community is the county government. And so we really began to um, work with the county to give them real-time data on what nonprofits were struggling with. And we did um, create 
through our downtown, local downtown nonprofit, um, a gift card program where our philanthropists actually put money onto these gift cards to support downtown businesses and retailers and people could buy them and double their money. So for $50, they get a $50 match from our donors. So we did that as a pilot program at County later scaled. We did it with 250,000, they added $2 million to it. And that gift card program now for that little downtown nonprofit, they've out, they, they're now doing it in multiple communities outside our county, which is really cool to see them turn this into a, an actual program. So that was something we did very quickly. So I always say, you know, government is scale, philanthropy is agility. And even in a crisis, philanthropy tends to move much quicker. And so we saw ourselves really being sort of these pilot programs. The other thing is we recognized, um, again, sort of where the gaps were. So cash aid, we started, we've never done cash aid before. And we did it through our family resource centers, our network of FRCs. Um, the, the other thing we did is um, cash aid to undocumented students because we recognize that DACA students, especially in our community, were falling through the cracks in terms of being able to secure some cash aid for rent, for, for what have you in the early days of the pandemic. So we were really quick to identify gaps and again, support them. The other thing we found is a lot of our nonprofits that are sort of providing basic needs and shelter were being supported uh, both from donors and again, county government when the CARES Act funding started flowing through our communities. But believe it or not, youth serving organizations and arts and culture organizations were sort of last in line. And obviously their business model totally evaporated with both schools being shut down and, and venues being shut down. And so we started providing emergency grants and then the county worked through us to provide CARES Act funding for those two specific sets of nonprofits. Um, and we're now actually today started another round of CARES Act funding just for general operating su support. So to Katrina's point, we've loosened, in fact, like we've let go of our sort of traditional grant requirements, our longer grant applications, um, and made it much easier for nonprofits to secure funding, at least during this period. Um, so all of that is, is um, what we did, um, both for our community, for grantees, and then with donors. We did a lot of also donor briefings on what nonprofits were struggling with. And in the last 18 months, we tripled our giving um, through our donors. So really proud of that. And as you said, Michelle, a lot of community foundations really rose to the challenge through their donors. Thank you both for that. Um, I'm gonna pause just for a minute and just to let everyone know that we are going to open it up for questions. So if you have any questions for Marianne and Katrina, please feel free to use the chat and um, we'll get those questions and do our best to answer all of them. Um, but before we turn to audience questions, just have one other one. We, we talked about um, some of the changes that have been made, you know, cash grants, um, reporting requirements diminishing and just, you know, maybe part of the nonprofit vetting pro process and maybe non 501c3s. And as we hopefully are coming out of this series of crises, I'm wondering if what you see are the lasting changes you hope will continue on with the practices that you've implemented over the past 18 plus months. Um, Marion, why don't you start? Sure. Um, to Katrina's point, I think for our community foundation, just we're beginning to make race very explicit in our work, which our, our board has tiptoed around that. And, and so our work now is to not just sort of re respond and be um, implicit in our work, but really begin to actually set the conversation and have that conversation. So in response to what we saw during COVID, um, and the racial reckoning. And for us in California, wildfires, I mean, it's been a rolling set of disasters that continues. The air quality today is actually really bad in our community because of the wildfires. So we're seeing climate change real time in, in Stanislaus County. Um, so what we really did is we actually expanded our leadership work beyond traditional sort of what we were doing pre-COVID was really education and building more education, equitable educational outcomes across the cradle to career partnership. We were part of the Strive network of communities across the country, really focused on sort of the continuum of, of children. And to give you some perspective of, on that, 540,000 people in Stanislaus County, 109,000 of them are K-12 students. Another 32,000 are age zero to five. So we recognize that really significant change has to happen, you know, beginning at birth all the way through a living wage job by age 26. But we expanded beyond education to include economic mobility, really recognizing who our essential workers were. And we began to ask ourselves, 
How do we move people from the margins of our economy to the center? What are the ladders that exist for people to move from an entry level job to a promising job to what we began to define as a quality job, which is you know, a living wage that supports people to be able to actually build wealth, not just live month to month, but also a living wage job that allows them health benefits and, and all of the other benefits of a job. So we've begun that work in earnest, again, with government partners, the private sector, local nonprofits, and our economic development corporation. So really focused on that. We had a social enterprise pilot uh, accelerator this year. Um, so that's the second body of work we did beyond education is economic mobility. We're using ARPA funds for that. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, our county got $108 million in ARPA funds. And as most communities had no plans because they didn't realize money was going to rain on them. And so we were quick to help them develop a transparent process co-led by the community foundation with community engagement at the heart of it, not some closed room where our elected officials make all the decisions on the funding. And again, ARPA is all written around more racial equity in, in, in our economic recovery. So community foundations can play a really strong role with their city and county uh, government. So we're doing all of that under economic mobility. And then the third piece, I just wanna end with this is if we, we are really missing, I think the entire point, if we don't respond to the challenges, recognizing it's a, it's a challenge of, of our democracy, of civic life, of civic engagement, of what it means to be a citizen of this country and, and, and our communities. And so we um, created Civic Saturdays programs. One of our staff members was a Civic Saturday fellow through Citizen University out of Seattle. Highly recommend that program to restore our civic faith. Um, the other thing we've done is we've created a next gen on board program, taking 20 young leaders of color in two year programs. We've started this first one and placing them on nonprofit boards that say they want diversity on their boards, but we're not kind of leaving these young leaders to their own devices. One, they're held together in the cohort among their peers, they meet together. Two, we're matchmaking them with nonprofits, but we're also developed a curriculum around nonprofit governance, fiduciary training, so that they're getting supported in terms of their education on how to serve on these nonprofit boards. So, for, and, and then finally, we're supporting four full-time reporters at our local newspaper, so we recognize the importance of community journalism and sort of fighting disinformation and misinformation at the local level um, is also part of our sort of civic literacy work in our portfolio. So, we're really doing a lot more and uh, we've expanded the scope of our leadership work. But I will also tell you we're, we're supporting beyond sort of individual grantees. We're also seeing that you know no man and woman is an island, no nonprofit can kind of just go it alone. So we are supporting cohorts, just like the Next Gen On Board program. We supported a cohort of K-12 institutions to develop a dual enrollment blueprint. We supported a coalition of youth serving organizations to become youth power building organizations and they created a youth power blueprint. So we're really interested in investing in cohorts and networks, not just individual grantees. And again, it comes back to building that, weaving together that relational uh, space. It's really been lost for quite some time pre-COVID but COVID has just accelerated that disconnection. So wherever we can build uh, space for groups to make meaning and put their um, issue above their service or their program, we're all about funding that type of work uh, through consultants, through data work, through convening ourselves. So that's some of the evolution of our leadership work, Michelle. Thank you for sharing. Seems like you've been quite busy this last 18 plus months. So I, I've learned that our chat was not a private chat. So you all know that we're out there looking for questions. So I'm going to ask if anyone has questions, please. Go ahead, um, put those in. And from now on, there'll be direct messages between the speakers. So just to let you all know. Um, and Katrina, let's let's go to you. What do you think will be some of the lasting changes that will be happening? So I, you know, I, I do want to say um, first and foremost that uh, Marion just she what she explained was was a, a whole lot of really interesting, engaging, and dynamic work. And I think um, for us at the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, we are in the process of figuring that out. I think I, I shared with you earlier that we had we are a seventy year old organization. Um, we have just transitioned within the last eighteen months. Our um, former president, who was in in a president, our president for over forty years, 
Um, and so there is a lot of change um, and transition within the organization. Um, and so we have a new president. We have uh, a relatively new senior leadership team. Um, and we are in the constant state of learning. Um, and so there are a lot, of, a lot of lessons that we're learning right now. I think one of the things that all of the issues that, that came upon us in 2020, um, the pandemic, the, the social justice uprisings, all of those things um, really made us know that it's, it's not okay to stand on the sidelines anymore, right? Usually community foundations that don't really pick a side, we're kind of Switzerland. We, you know, we, we try to be um, everything to everyone. Um, but in this moment, in this time, um, that is not, uh, what's the word? It's, it's, it's just not enough, right? So in order to have impact, long, long standing impact in community, to actually touch the communities um, that we wanna serve in a positive way, we have to pick a side. Um, and so in our last rounds of funding, we moved from just, just granting to nonprofits to really looking for those organizations that are heavily steeped in policy and advocacy work. We made sure that in our grant making going forward that we prioritize um, black indigenous and people of color organizations that we had those difficult conversations with nonprofits who we, we have granted to over years um, that, hey, we still value your work, but we are taking this intentional shift to make sure that we, we try our best to reset the playing field. And then we also, we also begin to create um, programs that I don't say empower community voice because community already has power. Um, it, is, it is our job, our hope to help to amplify that voice, to hope to give resources and support and activation to those voices um, to make sure that what the community feels that they need, um, that they get, right? Because a lot of times when you think of foundations, community foundations, family foundations, there's this idea of charitable giving, this charity-based work. And really we are all one community that should in, in turn be helping and supporting each other. And so I think the biggest change is a mindset change for us as an organization um, to not just think that we are doing this good service for those who are disenfranchised, but that we are rebuilding our communities in the way that they should be and that we wanna see them going forward. Thank you both so much. Um, and thank you to the audience. I see the call for questions was, was received and we have quite a few from the audience. So I'd like to just start sharing some of those and hopefully we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so one of the questions, some of the, you know, majority of some of the people that are in the audience are actually um, part of our funding information network partners, at least a great um, grouping of them. And some of them, most of them are um, based in public libraries. And so this one is really about how are you working with and investing in public libraries in your communities? Um, are there any programs that you would like to share? I'll start with you, Marianne. Um, the public library system and our chief librarians are part of our cradle to career partnership. So they do work in concert with all of our uh, partners that are uh, playing a role in that, which is our K-12 districts, our institutes of higher education. Uh, part of the cradle to career partnership includes early literacy. So we have five action teams, one focused on kinder readiness, early literacy, which is third grade reading proficiency, uh, fifth and eighth grade math uh, proficiency is the third action team. The fourth is completion of high school with a path, a plan, and purpose, including FAFSA and, you know, whether voc ed or college. And then the fifth is, again, a career, a living wage job, which we define as $26 an hour for one adult, one child at least by age 26. We have action teams that are inter interdisciplinary and our library, our library systems leading the action team focused on that early literacy uh, and really unpacking it. So again, I didn't list services and programs. I listed, you know, issues and, and data points and sort of the gateways that our children move through. So trying to re-engineer our thinking to gather around not a program or a service, but an issue in service of the community that draws multiple partners that all play a role in that issue. That's that's what we see the library really stepping up to do. They've created pop-up libraries that we funded in very rural parts of our community too. 
Thank you. Um, how about you, Katrina? How does CFG work? I think, um, I'm sorry, Michelle, but I, I yeah, think um, one, of, one of the things that popped into my mind directly around um, our work with, with libraries is around our civic and community engagement space, really supporting, um, utilizing those spaces as, as activation and informational places for community members um, around voting rights and voter education, reg voter registration. Um, we've supported um, local libraries who, who were activated in those capacities um, most recently with the 2020 elections. Uh -oh. There's a yeah. specific question um, specifically for you, Katrina, and that is around what type of feedback have you all received from the community about shifting to include more diverse organizations? Um, for the most part, the community is on board with it. Um, and realistically, you know, I've, I've had feedback that says it's about time, right? You, you have community in your name. <laughs> um, you really should be directing your, your, your support towards those, those members of community um, that need it the most. Um, and so, you know, I think the more challenging conversations that we've had, which are not as, as prominent are conversations with our donors um, around what that, what our redirection may mean for them and their focus areas. And what, what we have done in that capacity is really tried to tie in what our donors are critically passionate about with, with the direction that we're trying to take. So, so if you are you know, advocating for the environment, our, our support for BIPOC-led organizations does not, does not reduce or deduct from your, your support of the environment, but hey, let's start to talk about environmental justice issues within, within some of our communities um, who, who have had a history of of um, practices that leave them most vulnerable. And so just try, trying to tie in those, those information pieces with what they currently um, are passionate about is something that, that we're working toward. Thank you for sharing that. Erin, I don't know if you have any um, comments on that, just how you're shifting and any reactions from your community. Yeah, we, we, you know, I'll use the next gen on board program. We lack Latino led and black led organizations. We have none in our community. So really building that talent pipeline at, at the board level has been critical um, because we want to see more diverse boards and hire more diverse executive directors. So that's a, a longer game. It doesn't happen overnight. And where we found that the community foundation could play a role is by training and supporting the next generation of board directors that are younger. You know, I, I think the other thing, at least for me personally, was made really apparent is our adults have kind of screwed up our country. <laughs> and I think uh, where I find hope these days is among our younger generation. So I, we are really investing and in looking long-term at this community foundation about how we begin to transition power over to our youth and, and do it very intentionally and support them in that, not just kind of go, here you go, but really be intentional about how we design a transfer of, of power and support them and kind of get out of their way and, and stand behind them and support them and hold them but also that that leadership looks different than it has traditionally in our community. So being really intentional about who sits at the table and supporting those voices, as Katrina mentioned earlier, is really everything we do, we, we're thinking about who's sitting at the table, how do we build more equity at that table? How do we, and it's not just having one person and sort of that idea that there's, oh, we've checked off that box, but really building that culture and supporting those young leaders to step into their voice and, and, that is for us probably the most critical mission we have in the next decade or so. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just to step back a little bit, um, I'm wondering if you could help with this question. So how are you prioritizing your own connectivity with other community foundations um, to help fuel reinforce your own innovations at a local level? Um, Katrina, I'll ask you to start first if you have any comments on that one. Sure. Um, you know, 
I think most recently we have um, begun to partner with our, our local community foundations um, around specific issues. Um, one of the, the most critical right now is uh, emergency eviction assistance and housing. Um, and so we have, we, we have partnered with community foundations, uh, local government, um, municipalities to have these conversations around support. Um, because even though, you know, federal money is coming in to support, um, to support residents around this issue, sometimes deployment of those resources takes longer than, than um, we anticipate. And so we're in conversations with, with, with our community uh, foundations and municipalities about how we can support that effort, how we can get the money out a little more quickly um, and how we can sustain that support um, over the long haul. Because the reality is we are still in the middle of the global pandemic. It has, you know, um, every time we think we, we are edging out, uh, a new variant pops up. And, and so, so, you know, there are a lot of residents um, who are struggling and we want to just make sure that we continue to be that bridge to support um, to help them get the critical supports that they need. Are you Marianne? Sure. So again, um, being in the inland region, there's a community foundation in San Joaquin County, which is in Stockton ourselves. Then there's Fresno. It's called Central Valley Community Foundation and Kern Community Foundation in Bakersfield. So we have um, hosted for about two years now and continued during the pandemic by a Zoom hosted quarterly uh, legislative roundtables where we invite in the district directors at the federal and state level for our communities from Stockton down to Kern. So pretty wide swath because those communities tend to not have any voice in Sacramento as compared to the Silicon Valley, San Francisco and LA counties. So we're sort of a non-presence in Sacramento when you compare us to those geographically densely populated urban communities. So we decided let's pull these uh, legislative staff together quarterly and begin to work with them and unpack some of the issues so that we can begin to act as one body and also begin to develop relationships between place-based philanthropy and our legislative officials. So that's been very successful. And we actually got a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation up in each community foundation got a grant to really focus on dual enrollment and education and moving sort of the legislative policy work uh, in support of that in, in California and specifically in the inland region. So we're doing that now. So that's how we work with community foundations. The League of California Community Foundations a statewide membership body of about 30 plus community foundations in California has been incredible. They do uh, every other week briefings on different issues and have uh, just been a huge advocate for us, but also for our own learning. We have a community of CEOs through that network that are able to, and these are, you know, the biggest community foundation in the country is an hour and a half east of a Silicon Valley community foundation with 13 billion in assets. And then you've got, you know, very small rural community foundations, but we're all together around this common table, kind of, you know, uh, sharing best practices, ideas, challenges. Um, I also want to kind of expand on that question for communities like ours, obviously we're the only community foundation in our community. So we have a vested stake in the success of our United Way. And um, they have been struggling with their business model in recent years. So we actually have been grant funding them to run cohorts. Again, there's that word of homeless service providers focused on coming up with new solutions for a really big issue for us is homelessness. So we in the United Way actually agreed to take a lead on different issues. We're focused on uh, our economy and education, as I mentioned, civic literacy, they're really focused on strengthening and building the capacity of nonprofits and really focused on basic needs, shelter services, homelessness. So we kind of have divvied up the pie, if you will, and are very supportive of each other. Um, so I just, I wanna mention that it's, we're, it's community foundations and also just thinking about place-based philanthropy as a whole and, and supporting them. If, if our United Way goes away, um, it's just not good news for the community foundation. So we have a vested stake in their success. Thank you for that. Um, I love this idea of the connectivity and how you all are working together and sharing those best practices. Um, this is more of a practical question. Um, and someone had asked, how has it worked out or how does it feel to make it easier to award grants there? You know, we had that conversation on how um, your working to get money out um, faster to communities. 
Um, so I'm just wondering if you could share about what that looks like and letting go of the usual process. And has that been difficult or does it feel good and right and we'll continue to do that? Um, Katrina, you wanna start? Oh, um, so it feels good to let go of processes, um, but it can also be a little unnerving when, when, when you have trained your mind to look for certain things and criteria in order to, to, to assess an organization. And so, you know, at, you know, like I mentioned before, a lot of our transition is a mindset transition. And so we would ask questions like, okay, we, you know, we asked for mid, mid year and end of grant reports. What do we use those reports for, right? We ask for certain financial, um, do we need, do we need um, three years of, of internal audits for a grant that's under $10,000, right? So in the end, once you start to retrain your mind and, and, that, and, and reshape that muscle, um, then it does become easier. Then the questions that you ask are, okay, when we want an update from a, a grantee, how do, we want, how do we want that update shared? Um, could it be a conversation? Could it be um, a video? Like, like we're starting to, to really rethink what we need and, and how we want to tell the story of our work. Um, and so that's, that's an exciting space to be. Um, and then once you, once you relax some of those criteria, then you get to begin to form relationships with organizations, with people that you traditionally don't get to because they never met the minimum, right? And so you have different conversations. You have um, more intriguing conversations and you get to really know what the needs are, what people are looking for, what, they, what they're passionate about, what's challenging in their communities. And if, you're, um, if you have a place-based strategy, that's what you need to really make impact. Um, which, which nonprofits, uh, say that they're doing something in the community, but then the community members don't know them, and like uh, don't have a relationship with them. So, so it reshapes how you make decisions um, and who those decisions are, are best served for. Thank you. Miriam, do you have anything to share on that, that front? I would echo everything Katrina said relaxing all of our rules, our reporting, our timing of that, and just way more conversations. I mean, that's what our donors want at the end of the day. Let's be, how many of us actually read those long grant narratives? I don't know about you guys, but we don't. I mean, I hate to say that. <laughs> we do, but not, you know, we kind of skim and highlight, you know, oh, look, here's the data table, but our donors really want to hear the stories of the impact. So we are also lifting up storytelling as an initiative uh, that we're funding. We're funding a storytelling around our youth empowerment network and the youth blueprint. We've provided a grant to the Youth Leadership Institute. We want to know the experience of, of young adults moving through the pandemic beyond sort of numbers and reports in their voices. Thank you. So we just have one minute left. So I'm going to just ask to that point of storytelling, if you would like to share one story about um, an organization that you might not have normally funded that you have funded during this time. I know that's probably a lot to ask in a minute, but hopefully we could go a little over. If there's any story. Um, Katrina, do you want to start? Sure. Um... The, the organization that comes to mind is an arts organization, um, a Mario's Academy that is in um, South Fulton Clayton area in the Metro Atlanta region, um, is a small arts organization, arts education organization who had never received funding um, from the community foundation before, but has been around um, for over 10 years at least. Right, and so they were doing good work in community, have tried and applied before, but never met that minimum threshold to be considered for, for our grant funding. And they received a grant in 2020. Um, and the, the feedback that I got from the executive director was that, you know, that support, that funding was critical for them to be able to give that support to the, to the students, right? And to, to really make a difference in community 
And not just that, but that it really means a lot um, to have an organization, a community foundation that actually listens to them, that supports them, and that wants to continue to have conversations with them. And so not only did we give grant making support, but we really took the time over this past summer to, to really hear from arts organizations who, who felt like um, they were intentionally left out of, of those funding conversations and they're left off the table. Um, we've also had um, conversations with, with organizations about policy and advocacy and how um, because just because you have a specific focus of arts or whatever it is, doesn't mean that you don't have insight in, into all the other critical issues that are at the forefront. So not relegating um, the arts and culture community to one table, but to making the table um, one where everybody can sit and have conversation and dialogue around what we, what's needed for the community on the whole. Um, and so, you know, as we start to finalize our strategic plan for 2022, um, through 2025, I think. Um, it's, it's really important for us to retrain our own mind and our work to make sure that our tables are inclusive and that the voices at the table reflect the community um, in totality. Thank you for that. Marianne, do you have a short story you'd like to share real quick? Sure. We, you know, I'm really proud of the cash aid we provided to undocumented students and through our FRCs to families, but also we recognized as a result of our economic mobility exploration that there wasn't a nonprofit in our community really focused on financial mobility. We have a lot of nonprofits that are direct extensions of county government focused on social services, basic needs. And so we funded a small faith-based nonprofit that's Latino led, that's in community, in neighborhoods to become a community development corporation. We gave them a $15,000 grant to hire some consultants to develop a business plan and do a landscape analysis. And they ended up six months later as a result of that planning effort, they secured a $5 million grant from the county and ARPA funds to become a full-fledged community development corporation, which we didn't have. So really proud of our initial investment again, that agility and scale, agility and scale. We've, we've really leveraged the heck out of our small pot of, of money to, to make meaningful change happen long-term. Great. Well, thank you for that. And thank you both for your time. We're at time, unfortunately, and um, appreciate you being here with us today. And thank you to all of our audience for staying with us um, and dealing with our first session and um, some little technical glitches here and there. I um, hope you all enjoy the rest of Network Days. And thank you, Marianne and Katrina, for sharing your experiencing with us. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you.